views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Bronx Talk. It is election season and uh, a lot of people are asking who's running, who's not running, who has a chance to get in, who doesn't. And uh, this evening we're thrilled that Councilmember Richie Torres, who is the Democratic candidate for the 15th Congressional District, uh, is going to join us tonight. So we'll say right away good evening to Councilmember Torres. Nice to have you with us. It's an honor to be here as always and happy 26th. Yeah, that's right. It is the 26th yeah. anniversary of uh, Bronx Talk, and we're not counting years. Yeah. We're just going week to week. That's how we do it. Um, th this is a very interesting time. Um, first of all, congratulations Thank on you. your primary win. You defeated, I guess, 11 other candidates. is rather remarkable. Um, but I, I, if, if you're living in the United States, maybe even across the world right now, it would be hard not to start with the new, we're shooting this on Friday, the news that came down last night that the president of the United States has tested positive for COVID. It occurred to me that you were maybe the first or one of the first elected yeah. officials to test positive. So uh, I, I suppose your perspective might be rather unique in this regard. Uh, talk to me about um, what you think when you heard the news yeah. that the president of the United States is positive. Well, COVID-19 is personal for me because I was the first city council member to contract COVID-19 and it took me out of the campaign trail for nearly a month. And, you know, the Bronx had the highest rate of COVID-19 morbidity and mortality. So we were hit the hardest among counties in the United States. You know, the discovery that Donald Trump himself has COVID is a reminder that pseudoscience has consequences. Like Donald Trump uh, has been intent on politicizing public health and the precaution of wearing a mask, uh, which is the most reliable strategy for preventing the transmission of COVID-19. And, and that has consequences. You know, I obviously wish the president the best. I would never wish ill on anyone. Um, but you know, there's a sense in which the president was hoisted by his own petard. By not taking the crisis seriously enough, he wound up contracting COVID-19 himself and infecting his family, it appears. You, you um, uh, went through it, I think, reasonably well. I mean, you know we had you on the program. We don't need to get into yeah. you know, to personal details that you don't want to share. Um, it's scary. I mean, I, I frankly had a relative who passed away. My mom died of COVID. Uh, I'm sorry right, to hear that. Right in, that's okay. Right, right in April. And um, what, what impact does it have? Now, you were in the middle of a very competitive campaign. He's obviously yeah. in the middle of a, also a competitive campaign. Uh, frankly, you're about half his age, even less than half his age. Yeah. Um, you also uh, appear to be better fit than he would be. Yeah. Um, just what are your thoughts about uh, the effect of this on uh, American politics and, frankly, American government right now? Look, it reminds us that we not only have a public health crisis, we have a crisis of leadership. Um, the greatest challenge affecting the country and the city is not COVID-19 per se, it's COVID-19 compounded by a crisis of leadership. Um, you know, Donald Trump, because of his incompetence, presided over the deaths of 200,000 of our fellow Americans, and his incompetence has had a disproportionately destructive impact on the county of the Bronx and the city of New York. Uh, this is a, um, uh, a very interesting time to be getting in the Congress. Of course, a lot will hinge on uh, you know, whether the Democrats take the Senate, I think it's pretty well understood the Democrats will keep the House yeah. and certainly who becomes a president. Uh, his campaigning is certainly derailed right now and I, I, hard to think what he's going to be able to do. Yeah. Um, just what are, what are your thoughts about going into Congress at, at this, uh, potentially at uh, this particular time? 
You know, one more point about Donald Trump, you know, a powerful case could be made that COVID-19 is to Donald Trump what Katrina was to George W. Bush, that it's such a shocking display of incompetence that the voters are destined to punish him for it, right? If he loses in 2020, as I suspect he will, it's largely going to be because of his mismanagement of COVID-19. How do you look at health care? Of course, um, it, it appears the Republicans are going to try to repeal uh, Obamacare. We know that. Um, just give me a, a general view on keeping Bronxites healthy. Look, there's a commitment to ensuring that every American has access to health care, right? For the Democratic Party, health care is a human right. You know, some people advocate a public option. Others would go as far as abolishing all of private insurance and creating Medicare for all. Um, it's unclear what proposal is going to ultimately emerge, but there is a general commitment to ensuring that every American has access to health care, that we're reducing the cost and improving the quality of health care at the same time. But to speak more broadly, if, if the Democrats win the presidency and control both the Senate and the House, then we will have the makings of an FDR moment. Right? We will have a once in a century opportunity to govern as boldly in the 21st century as FDR did in the 20th century, right? We will have the ability to address the root causes of systemic racism, to create the next generation of green jobs, to fight catastrophic climate change, to modernize our infrastructure, to create a much stronger social safety net, to, to accomplish so much that would be impossible in normal times. So I see COVID-19 not only as a historic challenge, but also as a historic opportunity. And, and there's a sense in which that's exciting. Uh, you listed a, a couple of the options for health care, mm -hmm. um, which gets us into a, a, a political dialogue. You and I, I, I looked it up, you and I had a dialogue about what it means to be progressive. And when I talk to people who are admittedly and decidedly progressive, they say, well, you know, Espayat, uh, uh, Ocasio-Cortez, Bowman, they are true progressives. We're not so sure Richie Torres is on that page. So maybe using healthcare as a, as a test, a, a litmus test, how, how progressive are you? Would you advocate for Medicare for all? Where, where, where do you fall on that issue and maybe in general on the notion of the progressives in the Democratic Party? Look, I, it is not in my nature to obsess about titles. There are some people for whom the labels are the most important. I care about outcomes. For me, the central value of progressivism is actual progress. I should be judged by the actual progress that I create in the lives of my constituents. And in, here in New York City, no one, has been no one has been more effective at advocating for poor people of color in places like public housing than I have been. You know, I held a city council hearing that famously led to a $3 billion FEMA investment in public housing the largest FEMA grant in the history of New York City. So when it comes to actual progress, um, my progressive bona fides are second to none. On the subject of healthcare, I do support Medicare for All, which strikes me as the right position for the Democratic Party to take, uh, because we have a healthcare system in which it is more profitable for a surgeon to amputate a diabetic than it is to treat the diabetes or prevent the diabetes from developing in the first place, right? The organizing principle of American healthcare is neither health nor care, it is money. Money has corrupted American healthcare and we have to take the profit motive out of American healthcare. And the best path to doing so is Medicare for all. Uh, how do you see the transition from the city council to uh, potentially to uh, Congress? Um, what, what do you know and what do you bring with you? And what do you think you'll have to learn? Because let's face it, Washington, D.C. is a lot different uh, than City Hall. You know, Washington, D.C. has its own language and logic. And, you know, I'm going to have to learn, but I'm a fast learner. I'm going to work my heart out. I'm gonna ensure that I have people on my team who know the workings of DC inside and out. And look, it's in my nature to build coalitions and compromises and consensus. Um, I feel like I'm gonna be an effective legislator in DC because even though I have deeply held beliefs and values, I do have the ability to build coalitions across a broad section of public figures from across the country. Uh, let's, you, you brought up NYCHA. Let's talk about uh, public housing. 
Is there no greater need than getting federal funding to get uh, public housing squared away? I would say so. You know, the New York City Housing Authority, which manages public housing, is the largest provider of affordable housing in the country, right? If NYCHA were a city unto itself, it would be the largest city of low-income Black and Brown Americans in the United States. And it's been so savagely defunded by the federal government that it has $40 billion worth of capital needs. You have children who have been poisoned by lead. You have senior citizens who are freezing during the winter because the boilers keep breaking down. You have disabled residents who are prisoners in their own home because the elevators keep breaking down. You have asthmatics who are struggling to breathe in their own apartments in the face of molded and leaking conditions. So for me, ending the humanitarian crisis in public housing is, is a moral imperative. And if we make a multi-trillion dollar investment in infrastructure, there has to be a recognition that housing is infrastructure, public housing is infrastructure. We have to not only address the $40 billion capital need of public housing, but we need to reinvent public housing as the greenest city in America. Right? Public housing can be the laboratory for a renewable future in the United States. Imagine NYCHA housing with solar panels and rooftop gardens and electric heating systems and health-based community centers. Public housing can be a platform on which to develop a community, on which to provide a much wider range of public goods. I'll give you two points of history. Number one, if you look at public housing in the 50s, it was wholly different. It was really you know, the, the place to be admired, the place to, to you know, try to get to. Yep. Uh, at that time because of the nature of community, the yeah. uh, integrated nature of the housing, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, history will show that uh, in, in large cases, it was uh, the drug yeah. epidemics that uh, changed the nature of that. The other bit of uh, memory is a lot more recent. If I remember correctly, when you first came on Bronx Talk, when you were first elected to the city council, and I asked you, how much money is it going to take? I think the number was about $16 billion. Yeah, it's so risen. Since since that time, it's uh, all the way up. I, I want to ask you a little bit about real estate. Um, the city reported uh, that uh, much of your, uh, or some of your financial support, you've done very, very well uh, in terms of fundraising. Uh, they quoted a number of about $110,000 uh, came from people with ties to the real estate industry. Gentrification and building housing uh, in the South Bronx that is affordable is really a major issue. It was a major yeah. issue from the predecessor, uh, Jose Serrano, and certainly will continue to be an issue for you or whomever becomes the uh, Congress member uh, in that seat. Um, how do you view that? How do you view a charge that says, you know what, Richie Torres is really in the pocket of developers, not thinking about yeah. communities? Yeah. Um, well, it's an insulting comment. Um, here's what I would say. I would say first, I've taken a no corporate PAC pledge. So I have not received a dime from a single corporate interest, including real estate interest. Uh, second, most of the contribution, most of the money that was spent on my behalf came from the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, which is, which is dedicated to Latino empowerment, has nothing to do with real estate. Comes from the Equality Caucus, which is dedicated to LGBTQ empowerment has nothing to do with real estate um, and, and, and labor unions that, that spent both independently and directly. So, you know, I'm, anyone who knows me knows that I'm fiercely independent. I'm unbossed, I'm unbought. You know, nearly every elected official in New York City has accepted some money from real estate because not everyone in real estate is a bad actor. There are bad actors and those bad actors should be held accountable. And no one has been more effective at holding those bad actors accountable than I've been, right? I'm the one who opened an investigation into Kushner companies for falsifying building permits. For I recall that, we, for we talked about that on this program. Yeah. For displacing tenants from their homes and harassing tenants. So I'm willing to go after the worst actors in real estate, including the son-in-law of the president of the United States. I've sent a crystal clear message that no one is above the law. Uh, how do you see a gentrification then? In but the keep South? in mind, I just want to be clear that sure. um, it's, you know, a local congressman has no role in land use. Like land use is largely driven by the local council member. And there's concern about rezonings leading to gentrification. Do you know how many neighborhood rezonings that I've approved in my seven years in the city council? I, I don't have a count. No. Zero. 
None. Not a single one. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, fascinating, um, you know, that you that you say that. And I guess it's in part mm -hmm. an answer to my question about what about the transition from city council uh, potentially to Congress. Uh, here's something that you have a significant experience in, obviously, your years uh, in the city council. I do want to talk about uh, the uh, uh, Sergeant uh, Benevolent Association. And you are in the middle of a feud with them. They... they um, um, called you something. I'm not going to repeat it here. You're uh, welcome to say it if you want to. Um, uh, your concern was whether or not there was a police slowdown. Some will say, because people uh, in New York and the Bronx have long memories, well, wait a minute, Richie Torres was the guy who softened the right to know law. So why don't you give us the whole spectrum of how you view uh, policing uh, uh, in, the, in the city of New York, uh, the, the charges by the SBA... Sure. So about a month ago, I joined Borough President Eric Adams in sounding the alarm about the outbreak of gun violence in New York City. The number of shooting incidents and shooting victims have all but doubled. And we've seen gun violence unfold against the backdrop of the NYPD making far fewer gun arrests, solving far fewer gun cases, and responding more solely to gun crimes in progress all of which are possible signs of a slowdown. Now, I never said definitively that there is a slowdown. I said there should be an independent review to determine if a slowdown exists and to what extent has the slowdown, if it does exist, has driven violence in New York City. Are, are, Instead, you, um, are you willing to suggest that there has been or you're at this yeah. moment just- I mean, that's my, my hypothesis is there has been a slowdown. Okay. Yes. Um, but there should be an independent investigation to confirm whether that hypothesis is true. Um, instead of responding to those concerns with an opposing argument with facts and statistics, the head of the Sergeant Benevolent Association resorted to personal insult, calling me a first class whore. And it's worth noting that there is nothing benevolent about the Sergeant Benevolent Association. <laughs> the leadership of the SBA has a clear pattern of directing hate speech against members of the LGBTQ community, women, people of color, the head of the SBA referred to the Latina former health commissioner as the quote B word, referred to an openly LGBTQ elected official as a first class whore, referred to an African American NFL linebacker as a wild animal. He promoted among his members a video that portrays people of color as section eight scam artists and welfare queens. He appeared on Fox News with a mug bearing the image of QAnon which is a far-right conspiracy movement that traffics in anti-Semitism. He has threatened violence against the mayor and has illegally invaded the privacy of the mayor's daughter. Right? So the conduct of Ed Mullins of the Sergeant Benevolent Association is unbecoming. The model of the NYP is supposed to be courtesy, professionalism, and respect. And what we've seen consistently from all the police unions, especially the Sergeant Benevolent Association, is nothing but disrespect, a lack of professionalism, and discourtesy. I, I don't know how familiar you are or are not with uh, that June protest in Mott Haven that turned out so badly, more than 250 people were arrested. Uh, lately, Human Rights Watch came out yep. with a video that frankly was startling. I mean, I'd heard the tales, we had covered it on this program. Um, do, do you have thoughts about, um, number one, that incident, and number two, yeah. in general, the relationship between uh, Black Lives Matter and um, uh, policing in the city of New York, and of course, eventually- In, in, in New York City, we've seen the worst of both worlds. We've seen the over-policing of protest, peaceful protest in most cases, and the under-policing of gun violence. And you know, for me, I do agree with the proposition that we have to rethink the notion, the outdated notion, that policing should be the default response to every problem in our society. Mm -hmm. uh, that there should be social service responses to problems like substance abuse, and mental illness, and homelessness. That we need to rein in the role of policing in our society because the outsized presence of police has led to mass incarceration, systemic racism, um, and, and I think we would be better off as a society if we were to clearly define and delimit the role of policing in our society and fundamentally reimagine public safety. 
Uh, is the phrase defund the police the wrong phrase because it doesn't quite communicate uh, your thoughts about uh, uh, social services and yeah. putting funding or are, are you comfortable with that? Phrase? You asked me about the label progressive. I could care less about labels. I could care less about phrases. I care about results. I care about policies that have an impact in improving people's lives. So. Yeah. Did, did you think that, I mean, this is going backwards rather than forwards, but did you think the city council um, handled that notion properly? I mean, there's a lot of criticism that it was not really a movement of monies from one to the other, but really a recycling of funding within the uh, NYPD's uh, circle. Look, for me, I would have focused on pursuing policy changes. In the, for me, the, the fundamental issue in policing is a lack of accountability, right? A, a civilian who perpetrates violence against an officer will face accountability. But an officer who perpetrates violence against a civ civilian, especially a civilian of color, rarely faces accountability. Right? And therein lies the double standard that has the legitimacy of our criminal justice system crumbling right before your eyes. If I, as an elected official, am murdered by a police officer, there's no confidence that that police officer is going to be held accountable. Right? Eric Garner choked, I'm sorry, um, Daniel Pantaleo choked Eric Garner to death on videotape. It became viral and it took five years to fire him. And for me, the, there are two causes of a lack of accountability in policing. One is the doctrine of qualified immunity, which is a sense, essentially a license to brutalize black and brown lives with impunity. And the second is the blue wall of silence, which enables police misconduct. You, you know, take as an example, the shoving incident in Buffalo. There were two officers who shoved an elderly man to the ground, causing him brain trauma. And those two officers were held accountable under public pressure. And the whole unit to which those two officers belonged, resigned to protest the suspension of those officers. So that tells me that it's not simply a few bad apples, but that there is a deeper problem, a culture of impunity that enables police misconduct. Uh, do you see this as a legislative uh, uh, task? In other words, literally change the rules, or is there something else uh, involved? We have to change the rules. We have to bring greater accountability and transparency to American policing, and we need greater diversity. You know, the New York Times had an expose revealing that 90% of the leadership of the Police Benevolent Association consists of white males, more than 70% Republicans, more than half uh, live outside New York City. So it's hard to imagine an institution less representative of New York City than the Police Benevolent Association. Uh, how do you view, uh, maybe you've touched on it in a number of different ways already. How do you view the, the district that you potentially could be the uh, Congress member for? I guess in relation to um, many of the environment, let's use environment, environmental uh, challenges that Jose Serrano really championed. I mean, he was yeah. probably the, the most liberal uh, representative potentially in Congress. Um, how, how do you view those uh, challenges and what, what really um, will, will make a change? Look, the South Bronx historically has been known to be the poorest congressional district in America. Um, I would submit to you that COVID-19 has shown the South Bronx to be the essential congressional district. It is the home of the essential workers, the workers who put their lives on the front lines so that most of us could safely shelter in place. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm representing the best, the most essential congressional district in America, or I'm set to represent, I'm cautiously optimistic that I will represent the most essential congressional district in America. But I realize I have big shoes to fill. You know, Jose Serrano has an enormous legacy on environmental justice, his greatest legacy is the cleanup of the Bronx River. And as I said, if, if an FDR moment comes to fruition, then we're gonna have a once in a century opportunity to make a multi-trillion dollar investment in green infrastructure. And I will fight my heart out to ensure that those dollars come right here in the South Bronx. 
Many people look at the uh, potential uh, new look of the Bronx delegation in the United States uh, Congress and the House of Representatives uh, with Jamal Bowman, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, Adriano Espeyat, and of course yourself, potentially, um, as a, a real sea change in many ways. Um, how do you see that change? Do you get along well with the others? Has there been interaction? Or are you really going to, you know, if you do get elected, show up uh, on, um, uh, on, uh, uh, you know, on, on January 1st and say, well, here we are. Uh, just give me a, a little bit about all that whole well, uh, well, I mean, I, I have a, a longstanding relationship with Congressman Espayat. I, um, I received a congratulatory call from Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez. And I just had a panel with Congressman Bowman and my closest. He's not a congressman yet. Let's our, a future Congressman Bowman. I'm optimistic. Potentially. And 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 one of my my probably my closest friend in the class of new Congress people is uh, Mondaire Jones, who's north of, of of Bronx County. He's a prospective Congressperson as well. Um, you know, I, I met with the with Speaker Pelosi on Wednesday, right after oh, that's her. Nice right after her meeting negotiating the COVID-19 relief package. Uh, I'm just curious, did you go to Washington or you did it like this virtually? No, I went to Washington. So I met with um, Speaker Pelosi in her office. There's a picture of the meeting on, on my social media. And I know for a fact that she takes pride in representing the most diverse House conference in the history of the United States. More than 60% of the Democratic House conference is LGBTQ, woman, people of color. Um, that's a remarkable breakthrough, and she's at the, the center of it. Well, uh, I, I mean, it is, I, I think it's, yeah. an, I mean, you know, I've been yeah. sitting in this seat for many years. I think it's an exciting time. And I check multiple boxes. I'm Black, I'm Latino, I'm LGBTQ, and as a millennial, I represent the next generation of leadership in the South Bronx. When Jose Serrano became the congressman for the South Bronx in 1990, I was two years old. Uh, so, <laughs> and, so, and you, you were know, four years old when we started this program. We're six years old. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if, if I win the general and become uh, the congressman for New, York, for New York 15, the South Bronx, it will represent uh, a genuine passing of the torch after 30 years of leadership from Jose Serrano. We've got about 45 seconds left. Uh, you're still being paid by uh, the New York City taxpayers. Yeah. Uh, um, you've got plans, things to still do before? Oh, we, we have investigations going on, and I'm going to release those investigations in the weeks or even days to come. So stay tuned. Okay, well, uh, when, if you are elected, I don't say when, I will say whether you are elected. Yeah. Uh, we would certainly hope you'll come back. And I know how hard it is to schedule an appointment with you, so you must be busy. Um, but but we, you've been a great guest today, and uh, we wish you good luck in your campaign. I will mention to our viewers uh, that uh, next week we're going to uh, have GOP candidates. We'll have Republican candidates. Uh, there are, about, I think, about 10% of the Bronx is Republican. We'll represent them on the Bronx State Television. But we thank uh, our Council Member Richard Torres for joining us. And um, uh, good luck if you do get elected. Good luck in the rest of the campaign. And uh, folks, we'll see you next week. And by the way, the week after, it looks like we're going to be doing uh, a, another forum with uh, elected officials about Hispanic Heritage Month. So stick around. You'll uh, see more about that. Thanks to our great producer, Stephen Powell. And uh, please stay safe. Goodbye.